What follows is a panel discussion about different types of speakers that were shot last Saturday at Capital Audio Fest. And I was supposed to be there, I couldn't make it, and I called on my friend Sean Casey from Zoo to be the moderator of the panel. Did a great job. Um, and my friends uh, Herb Riker from Stereophile Magazine and Michael Trey from Sound and Vision, they were on the panel. And also John DeVore from DeVore Fidelity, a company based here in Brooklyn. And completing the panel is Zev Schleck, who, who has a company called Pure Audio Project. He makes open baffle speakers. Actually, this is one right behind me here. Uh, and the review will be coming up on that one real soon. The other thing I have to say is a big thanks to Ken McCaleb, who also writes for Stereophile, for shooting this video. He, he came in at the last couple of minutes to do it for me, and I really appreciate that. So, but unfortunately, the video is not complete. So uh, I will return at the end of this video for some closing comments and observations. So stay tuned for that. And as always, thank you guys for watching, but let's get to the video right now. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Casey. Um, I am trying to fill in for Steve Guttenberg. Not that I can actually fill in for Steve Guttenberg. But, uh, so today we're, we're going to discuss loosely loudspeakers, differences of loudspeakers. We've got four great guests. And uh, we've got Herb Reichert. Uh, Pretending to be Steve Guttenberg. <laughs> nice. So between two of us, we can fill in for half of Steve. Maybe. Right, something like that. Pretend to be Steve Guttenberg. We'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> so Steve, uh, uh, Herb, writing for Stereophile. Then we've got Michael Trey, uh, writing for Sound and Vision. Uh, John Vord, for Fidelity. And Zev from Pure Audio Project. Um, these guys have a ton of knowledge. I would like uh, participation from you guys. We will have question and answer, uh, say, the second half of this. So 20 minutes is going to be a little bit of a, uh, just a discussion. Uh, but uh, I'm going to give these guys each uh, a bit of time to talk about what they do and why they're sitting up, up front. And uh, again, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. So we'll start with Zev. Zev, uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. I'll just pass the mic off. Hi. Good uh, morning. Happy to be here. I'm from Pure Audio Project. The company started a bit more than five years ago, and we provide a whole line of modular open buffer speakers. Uh, hi. The uh, Fidelity, uh, we're now almost at 20 years old, um, and we make a, a line of uh, <coughs> much more conventional home audio uh, speakers, generally ported boxes. <laughs> Um, and uh, I don't know that there's any difference in the popularity of uh, the ported box now compared to 20 years ago or 50 years ago, um, but certainly the technology has come a long way and we can certainly get into that uh, as we continue the discussion. Hi, my name is Mike Trey. I write for Sound and Vision magazine. I also work a lot on turntables, which is not really Part of this discussion, but uh, I worked in high-end audio for 35 years. I was the importer for avant-garde morning speakers for a while, along with Herb. Um, and I guess you know, over the 35 years, I've figured out a few things about speakers. So, and he's owned every possible technology <laughs> of speaker, and probably still does. Probably, yeah. yeah. So, hopefully, that will help. <laughs> I am Herb. Uh, <coughs> Mike Trey and Steve Guttenberg are without a doubt my closest friends on the planet and the best ears that I'm aware of. The different kinds of speakers, the flat speakers, the open baffle, I remember the DQ-10 was like changed my life. And I remember the first time I heard horns. I was like, what? What? And I was never a big clip phone fan. And I remember the first time I heard like a really big, in fact, two weeks from today, I'll be listening to an authentic 1930s RCA theater system, and with any luck, they'll be playing real movies from that time with the same soundtrack. So it will be recreating a 1930s theater experience. And to this day, I've never heard anything like the Western RCA theater stuff. But the point is, learning to listen is the secret of having an open mind here. When I came to Stereophile, and this is all I want to say, is that I'm like, 
John, all you do is review boxes with tweeters, live around tweeters in them. Doesn't that get boring? And kind of the answer was, that's all we could measure. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> to set the stage, all of us have things that do it for us, to, to get us off in audio. Um, that isn't the same for all of us. Otherwise, we would all be listening to that one cut on that one Steely Dan album. So, so we all have different things that light us up. And getting there, and the more you know the, your own personal targets, and the more you know what these other designers can offer you, the quicker you'll be able to get there. So we're going to start with, uh, uh, we'll start with boxed speakers a little bit, and, and, and how their advantages, disadvantages, what they do right, what they may do wrong. Um, and so I think John leading off with that discussion, since he does a fantastic job of, of the, you know, a boxed style speaker, and we can talk about that. I mean, that's a, it's a good place because that's the majority of the market. And, uh, and I compare and contrast, I, I think there's no right or wrong in this. And so let's just kind of treat it like uh, exploratory, right? So John, here you go. Thanks. Um, so I guess uh, before I go into why um, why ported for Dwarf Fidelity, uh, just to step back and try to view what the speaker is in in the context of a system. And so the speaker is essentially the it's the transformer. It's the it's the connection between uh, a hi-fi system and a room. Uh, it's it's actually converting just the stuff that's going on and all the electronics into the music that is in the room, and so in that context, it's it's like what it, what any transformer is is trying to do, whether it's uh, trying to uh, convert the impedance of a high impedance of a tube circuit into something low impedance for uh, a loudspeaker driver. What it's doing is it's transforming and converting uh, the energy into what ends up being in the room. So you need to look at the room as a very, very important, maybe the most important component in any setup hi-fi system. And the the gear itself. And the idea is, is how to convert it. And, and so different types of speakers interact with both of those sides of the equation in very different ways. Uh, some speaker technologies are easier to drive. Some speakers are harder to drive. Some have different requirements for amplifiers. And then on the room side of the equation, uh, speakers interact with the room in very different ways, depending on, on how they're putting out the speaker energy. Um, there are speakers that put energy out just in one direction. There are speakers that put it out in two directions out of phase, two directions in phase. There's you know uh, omnidirectional speakers. So, um, and that all obviously that has huge effects on the way that the room is energized and the way that you experience it in the room from various places. Uh, box speakers, uh, it was a solution to uh, the room side of the equation. Um, before box speakers, speakers tended to be uh, larger. There were some planar speakers, but a lot of them were uh, horn speakers, big horn loaded speakers, uh, which require generally require a little bit more distance um, in order for them to gel at the listening position. So a box speaker um, can be physically more compact uh, and depending on how you configure it, um, you can have uh, radiation out any, any one of those uh, planes that you want. Back, front, side, bottom, top. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think that's probably why it has become the dominant technology is that there's, it's very adaptable and a lot of different people can bring a lot of different ideas into, uh, into the box speaker and come out with extremely different versions. I mean, even Sean, he's not talking about his speakers, but you know, it's an example of a box speaker that, that is very different from something like an, a classic LS35A really on the other, on the other pole. Uh, of the box speaker. So there's a lot of, um, probably of any of the technologies, there's the most uh, variety uh, in, in box speakers. Um, 
we chose the uh, ported box, the base reflex uh, box, <coughs> primarily uh, to address the other side of the chain, the amplifier side of the chain. A box reflex speaker uh, requires a lot less um, from the amplifier that's driving it, generally speaking. Uh, a, ported, a, a, a ported speaker um, would be contrasted to an infinite baffle or, or a acoustic okay. suspension speaker. Um, which, generally speaking, requires more power, regardless of sensitivity ratings, requires more power, requires far more uh, driver excursion in the lower frequencies. So the trade-off with the bass reflex is that it, it uh, addresses somewhat the drivability side of it, higher sensitivity, easier to drive from various types. Does anyone else want to talk about box speakers? Mike? Mine is really good. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Keep going. All right. So I think what John talked about is the most important thing, which is, or at least one of the things he talked about, which is how does the speaker interface with the room? And that comes down to dispersion. Like different types of speakers have different types of dispersion. And it's all based on the size of the driver, especially at high frequencies. So if you look at a tall panel speaker where you got a little narrow ribbon, what you get is you get dispersion left and right, but almost none up and down. A lot of people, when they look at their room, they forget about the ceiling, which is the biggest problem in most rooms. It's reflections off the ceiling um, and the floor. And so with a big panel speaker, you get very little, you know, it sort of projects like a beam. The sound falls off a lot sl more slowly than it does with a box speaker, so you don't have to turn it up so loud. And uh, you get a very narrowly defined sweet spot. So you're dealing with different variables that are going to affect your choice of speakers based on what type of listening you do. If you want a speaker that's going to fill a room and you know, you're going to sit around and have dinner and you know, have parties or whatever, panel speaker is no good because you've got to sort of sit in one spot and listen to it. Um, I don't know what else we're going to The horns. Here, you talk yeah, about so we're talking about uh, storm. Maybe yeah. let's kind of stick with the box thing for a bit. Okay. So, yeah, Herb, you're going to have stuff to think, say about that. It's hard to beat these guys. So. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, this, both of them are really important things. My first inkling when I'm listening to them is like, well, what about headphones? They don't interface with the room, but we won't go there today. <laughs> uh, I'm going to just mention horns a little bit. Sure. Uh, the most, if when when, if you look at sheets for Altac or Western Electric, you know the old propaganda sheets. They don't mention sensitivity in terms of dBs at one watt, one meter, or anything like that. They talk about how many people are in the room. Well, this will work for a room like right now. I just counted the people. There's about 110 people in here. They made a horn just right for 110 people in a room, and. Uh, this is really almost humorous, but back in the 60s, Yankee Stadium, which at that time seated 55,000 people, had only seven voices of theater A7s powered by one 30-watt amplifier each for 55,000 people. Uh, so it's a different technology, but it does what's, what Mike was alluding to. It, it, Directs. It's very directivity or very directional. They would give you a shot and they'd say, you know, how wide, you know, and how far away the first row had to be. These are the kind of specs, which when you get into box speakers, you get into this kind of minute. Uh, but as you mentioned, excursion, you know, how long does how far does the driver move? And all you subwoofer guys, you know, how long, how far does the driver move? The further it moves, the more it just starts. There's, I mean, that's just basic law of physics. The first time I had a horn system, I, I thought there was, it was broken. No matter how loud I play it, the bass woofer never moved. And I get over there really close, it's not moving. And it was playing like 100 dBs and it wasn't moving. That means it's not distorting for the most part. I've listened to a lot of horns that are like, you know, eight feet square. You can just stand inside of them. There's usually one narrow band where the, where the horn resonates, where the, 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 the tail of the, 
of the horn resonates and it's right here and you can put your head here and it's not there and you can put your head here and it's not there and in between it seems distortions which when i'm listening to a box speaker it's like you hear the room panel speaker i'm inclined to think on a good day in the right room and if you listen in the near field really low distortion it seems like to me a horn in a room this size can be really low distortion <laughs> so what about open baffle open bath yeah <laughs> get rid of the box we can talk about box first yeah i will i will talk about boxes um, i think that the main difference or main you can explain easily open baffles relating to a box is by simply mentioning that the box speakers are designed i hope i'm not doing a mistake now they are designed to have the right sound in a certain area where they are shooting to. While open bottle, they are open and the energy goes, travels to all directions. So what you get when you put open bottle in the room is uh, that the sound is a result of the waves that are leaving the speakers to all directions and the room. So basically open bottles, they don't really come in conflict with the room. We never use, by the way, room treatments at shows because of this reason. They play in the room, and what you hear is the ambience of the room and the source. Now, if you think about yourself living in the room, your ears and your brain is accustomed to the sound of your room. You live there, you spend most of your time there, you are simply accustomed to it. It sounds pleasant to you. If it wasn't pleasant to you, you wouldn't be living in this room or you would do something. If it's echoing or so, you would be disturbed by simply talking there. So when you put open baffles in the rooms, most people think, many people think that oh, how, how will they work? We should treat the room totally the opposite. You will have the ambience of the room around the speakers. The problem there is that though it seems very simple, you know, you have a panel, you put a few drivers, it will play music. Any drivers that will, you will put on open baffles will play, it will sound reasonable. But because there's nowhere to hide, there's no manipulation you can do on the sound, there's no correction you can do unless you're doing digital things. But if you're working analog with crossovers, what you hear is exactly the sound that is playing out of the drivers. So I don't want to call it the trick, but the important thing is, to my opinion, is in the drivers themselves and a bit of design and a bit of luck to have it really playing right. Uh, one personal experience I can share with you is the first open bottle I personally built was a $300 kit uh, with uh, one driver. I put it on a panel. Heard it. Actually, it's not the first one. The first one was when I was a kid, I dismounted the Fender Rhodes and used the, the, the speakers of the Fender Rhodes connected to an amplifier. Only later I realized it was open bottle. It's totally open from behind, 15-inch woofer and so on forth. But I go back to the example. This simple $300 kit in every single parameter didn't sound as good as the other speakers that were in the room. But there was some kind of magic in the overall presentation. So you compromise on the quality you know, of single parameters, the highs, the mids, the bass. Everything was not as good as the other speakers, which costed at 7,000 or 10,000. But there was something there that was very musical. And this something is the essence of open baffle. And we try to bring it to the edge. One comment about what Shin said about what's uh, right and wrong for people. We are selling direct and we have comments from customers and it's amazing that, you know, we stopped talking in terms of upgrades and improvements, but we started talking in terms of changes and your preferences. And you see example that, you know, I give you one. I had a customer who bought second hand and complained that he's not happy. The sound is too bright, too sharp, <coughs> not pleasant, not musical. I remember the customer who bought it, and I remember he was happy at the beginning, but then he didn't communicate with us for two years. I asked him to send me the photos. He sent me the photos, and I saw that everything was upgraded. The capacitors were upgraded. The cables were upgraded. There was a small capacitor helping the transient the response and everything. And asked him a few questions. I told him, you know what? Let's start so-called downgrading, putting back the, the, the simple components. And the result was that uh, he was extremely happy. Now, other people responding totally differently. So we have cases that the same speakers go through modifications that are so different that if one of us will put what other is doing, he'll probably will be surprised. 
But that's the beauty in this market. It's so personal, so subjective and not objective. And all of us, we enjoy what we love. Shin. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to unpack a little bit of that. <laughs> so there's lots of ways to get to where you want to go, but you have to know where you want to go. That's rule number one. What is it that does it about playback for you? Is this? Is this? Yeah, there we go. All right. Uh, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about horns. Herb is a... Herb's going to kind of lead us on that. But we talk about the speaker, the, the vibrating membrane as a driver. Ha talking with, with people, users, uh, consumers daily, most people don't even understand why we call it a driver. So we'll unpack that a little bit. A, a driver is called a driver because Western Electric, back in 1925, needed a horn to make this membrane make enough sound so that the audience could hear it. So the driver worked in conjunction with the horn, and the horn design was specific to the audience, and they knew their audience. We, we don't really know our audience in hi-fi, because hi-fi is diverse, it's, it is diverse. So whether it's a box speaker, open baffle speaker, a horn speaker, or headphones, or anything that communicates sound and, and tone to us, is a, a medium or a method, and again, there's there's a lot of ways to go to get there. It, a box speaker can be an omnidirectional. It cannot be. It can be a point source. Open baffles can be designed to. And when we say these things, we be, we think we know what we're talking about. I don't think we actually do know what we're talking. About. Why do you want a cylindrical wavefront as opposed to a spherical or hemispherical wavefront? Th those are some questions to consider, and and I would like us to talk more about why that's an interesting idea. And, and what is it about horns? Why, why when you have a, a Western electric system from 1935, why does it sound, to Herb's ears, the best it can sound? And, and, and probably it's mine too. I, I don't know how much we've advanced the art in 80 years, to be frank. What, what, was, what these guys back in the 30s were doing was special. At what has been done special? Well, we can't fit horns in our houses because a horn system needs to be so long so that the wave, the, the, the bass frequency, for example, a, a 30 hertz wave is a quarter wave is, is roughly 12 feet-ish. You know, it, it's complicated. It does a thing. How can you have that in your house? Well, you can be a crazy guy in Silvatone in Korea, who will fit it in his house. That's one way to do it. So another way is you take over your basement and you make that happen in your basement. And, and so uh, let's talk about horns for a while. Do you mind her directing that? So why, why are you enamored with a technology that is basically at the dawn of audio? But you said the word, and everyone here, it's distortion. I mean, I hate to be the guy saying it, you know, all oh, subjective, objective, but I, you know, all the objectivists go, you know, I'll write a review of an amp that might have, you know, 0.1% total harmonic distortion, and the, the readers will, you know, troll me and say, well, I guess you like listening to distortion. You know, the horns are just crazy, actually, and you can measure it. If you guys read Hi Fi News, they measure total harmonic distortion for various speakers. And it's actually sort of surprising. And in the old days, people used to run a square wave through a speaker. Try doing that today and see what a lot of these really complex crossovers can do to a square wave. But the transducer isn't moving much. And that original 1925, 26 Western Electric transducer, I was talking to the people, I was reviewing the Focal Utopias, and I said to the designer, I said, geez, that driver looks an awful lot like a Western Electric 555 diaphragm. And he laughed and he goes, doesn't it? Now, we're talking one of the most low distortion transducers available today. It sits on your ear, but it's literally, I mean, you'd have a hard time if you were, hadn't looked a few times, you wouldn't recognize the difference between, you know, the diaphragm and a high uh, 
Christ had fun today and the first transducer ever. But as Mike was saying, how it interfaces with the room, and the same with open baffles. To me, an open baffle was kind of like a, a box speaker without the box. And it, to me, it was kind of a magic because all of a sudden you didn't hear the wood pile moaning at you from the front of the room. No offense. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> now, these are great designs. By the way, I'm a fan of both of these guys' speakers in a big way. But if you've ever heard low distortion, you recognize it instantly. Most audiophiles have not heard a low distortion transducer, either a giant horn that's, you know, that's, you know, that's lighting up a huge space, but effortlessly, or for example, a headphone, or Mike listens to his quads, basically like headphones in the extreme near field. And if you listen to box speakers in the same thing, let's say I put up couple pair of, or a pair of LS358s right here, like four feet from you. They're going to sound big, and they're going to sound low distortion, and they're going to, again, they're going to sound low distortion. When speakers sound low distortion, and same with Sean's. I mean, I, have, I actually have zoos at home, and I listen to them at great lengths, and I mean, the driver, it doesn't move. It's just sleeping all the time. And you can tell it's a low distortion device. A lot of the bigger speakers and a lot of the really popular, expensive speakers, once you've heard low distortion, you walk into a room or a show like this and you go, you know, it's kind of like the fingers on the chalkboard. You know, that third order that everyone doesn't want. It's there. And drivers, now, I would bow to John DeVore on this, but to me, dynamic drivers, the more they move, the more noise they make. And it's kind of a rattly, screechy, it's a sound. You can hear it. Once you don't hear it, it's obvious. And the good designers, it's usually showing up at the crossover region as well when the driver is starting to work too hard. And again, the answer to the question, I think, on all of these speakers is when they're operating in a range of low distortion and you're sitting fairly close and the room isn't swamping what you're hearing. I was just in Sean's room and I was kind of admiring the way he finds, he gets rid of the room by just having an insanely big room. He might as you know, I just no, heard a report. Like it's, like, it's like recording in the desert, you know, on a quiet day with no wind. You know, there's no, you don't need a recording studio if you've got a big enough space and there's nobody rattling tin cans in the back room. Low distortion is the answer. Michael probably knows more about that. Uh, there's also, um, so horns and distortion tend to go hand in hand, horns and low distortion. But uh, there's, I want to talk something about types of distortion and types of horns. So the types of distortion, a lot of people in here are, maybe are thinking, you know, Herb says, People haven't heard a lower distortion. People haven't heard um, horns. I mean, I know for me, you know, I heard an old pair of Flips Heresies and something like that. And sure, I'm sure uh, the THD was very low, but the the frequency distortion was gross and unlistenable, in my opinion. So there's a lot of there's a lot of types of distortion that, that we can be talking about. Certainly, the the low excursion of a driver prevents that driver from overloading or starting to break up. Um, and so that type of distortion is uh, almost always going to be very low in a compression driver or something like that, or in a very, very large uh, direct uh, radiator. Um, but the, pro the problem that a lot of people associate with that sort of horn sound and just like, oh, I don't like horns, it has nothing to do with the type of distortion that, that Herb's been talking about. It has to do much more with uh, non-linearities in the horn that cause, you know, resonant peaks in the frequency response or the beaminess that, um, that, prevents, uh, that prevents the horn from actually interfacing neatly with the, the big woofer. Uh, in a normal-sized room, you know, like the voice of the theaters that Herb was talking about, 
I know a lot of people who have had voice of the theaters in their in their homes, and for certain things they do very well. But unless you can get 20 feet away from it, it's never going to really uh, turn into a coherent wavefront where that woofer and the the horn synchronize and give you the frequency response uh, in a coherent way uh, from top to bottom. So that's there's sort of a difference in in the kinds of distortions that we get. And in in a normal uh, domestic listening situation, the excursion uh, and the the driver nonlinearities tend to be less of an issue than they do in Yankee Stadium, where you're you're putting out 120 <laughs> dB. Um, the other thing is that uh, horns can be very different as well. And I think that the kinds of horns that we've started talking about are what's called compression driver horns. So the kind the driver that Herb was talking about that, that resembles the, the JM Labs diaphragm, that's a compression driver. And so that's, uh, they tend to be very small, incredibly lightweight, and you, basically they're most closely resemble uh, dome tweeters or dome mid-ranges in what, what normal uh, speakers are these days. Except that they're not they're not designed to fire into a room and put sound into a room. What they're doing is they're they're firing directly into something that's very, very close to them. So there's a huge resistance. There's like the the air between the diaphragm and that thing uh, that they're firing into is preventing them from moving very much. So they're moving these tiny, tiny amount and putting out very little energy. And then what the horn is doing is it's converting that very small uh, energy. Um, it's a, again, it's a transformer. It's, a, it's an acoustical transformer. And it's transforming that small energy into the large energy uh, in different ways, whether it's very wide or whether you have a really long, narrow horn to shoot uh, further distances. It's very, very simplified versions of it. But that's kind of uh, the, t the type of driver that I think that, that we've been talking about. Uh, I would not add anything on the horns, but uh, about distortion. Distortion is a very general term, and I agree with uh, you that uh, sometimes we hear distorted things, but we don't really know whether it's uh, this distortion or whether it's frequency response. But one thing I want to tell you, and it's a personal comment, not a scientific one, don't be afraid of a bit distortion. Distortion is a very important element in our life. We have it all over. We have it in the concert halls. We have it in every room. There's always some kind of a flavor that the, the surrounding adding to music. So don't get panicked. We, you, you can find cases that you will not enjoy music in an in a choir chamber. You will sit there and you will not be happy there. You will be happy in a concert hall. It has a bit of echoing, a bit of distortion, a bit of bad influences. So don't be afraid of it. It's all about taste. And uh, there are manufacturers that are actually adding some distortion. And they even publish articles about it. It's very natural if you're familiar with the mastering process in the production of music. So after the mix, when the music sounds like a perfect, I call it firm pharmacy sound, it sounds like in a white walls pharmacy, they take it to a mastering process. And in this process, they also add a little bit of distortion here and there, so it sounds pleasant. So I hope I didn't disappoint anybody. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, so uh, again, to unpack a little bit, a lot, a lot was said there, I think, and we're going to have you guys ask questions to these guys in just a second. So I, I mentioned driver. Why do we call it a driver? Well, because it drives the horn back in the third 20s, 30s, 40s. Back when we had no power to work with, we had to get as much power out of that transducer as possible because we had a handful of watts to work with. And, and why do we call it loading? It's because the driver resists enough air is coupled, air density, enough air density is coupled to that driver that it, that it sees a resistive, non-reactive load. So, we, so it has to drive an air column. And that bumps up its, its efficiency because, like John said, it's a transformer. It takes a high particle velocity and converts it into a low particle velocity exit. And that's the main thing of a horn. One beef I have is when we... There's, there's no one way to spin a cat. My personal taste, 
I go to a concert and they have a mix of direct radiators and horns and I want to shoot myself because it's driving me bad because it sounds different everywhere and the sensation is different. So big bass bins at a rock show sound totally different than a horn bass bin, even if everything else that we can measure is correlated. So, so wave fronts is one thing that I'm sensitive to, and that's something that you may be able to see that these guys are also highly sensitive to, is the wave front, how it interplays with your room, how that driver is loaded at, or unloaded in the case of a panel speaker, for example. A panel speaker is always loaded because its, its density, its film density, is really quite close to air density. It's super inefficient electrically, but fairly high efficiency in its um, conversion of acoustic to acoustic, right? So there's a lot of ways to get to your Nirvana. And your Nirvana is, yours is different than yours. Otherwise, again, we'd all like that one Stevie Dance song. <laughs> and the, really, the first album, first cut with uh, Todd Record, the guitar solo on that one, holy shit. <laughs> That's the best cut. But no one ever plays. It's killer. So, uh, questions. Um, I think we'll, we'll just move to questions. We've got 15 minutes or so. Back in the back corner, I'm going to bring you the mic. Yeah, yeah, just talk right into uh, uh, Relatively little was said about acoustic suspensions. Uh, it has often seemed to me there's a lot more impact in, in the low bass with an acoustic suspension speaker. And I, I'm curious if anybody knows why that's the case. It seems to me it's because, possibly it's because the sound is coming from one place, an acoustic suspension speaker, namely the woofer, is coming from two places, and a bass reflex speaker, the woofer, and, and the port, so that the, the, you know, the wave front is, is, uh, is more diffuse with a bass reflex speaker. Okay, we're we're just going to have John answer. All right. Uh, so uh, basically, I think, so you, your, your comment was that it feels like it's got a little bit more impact um, in the bass. Um, there's a couple of uh, technical things that are going on that are very different. Uh, an acoustic suspension speaker is a very loosely driven speaker. So the magnetic force it has less control, the suspension is, is much uh, looser because it's relying on the springiness of the air in the box to essentially control it. It, it provides the uh, damping. That's why it's called acoustic suspension. Right, because the acoustic, <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. So um, there, is, is, uh, there is the sensitivity uh, issue uh, because you can't put a gigantic magnet on, a, on an acoustic suspension woofer and still have it behave correctly in that. So Generally, they, they do need more power. Uh, another thing, though, that's happening is that the, the, that driver, so, so let's, compare, let's contrast that to a bass reflex uh, speaker. A bass reflex speaker is behaving in a similar sort of way, but it's, um, the port is now introducing uh, a tuning resonance in that box that is uh, targeted to a very specific frequency. And at that frequency, it's putting out energy that is opposite, opposing to the energy that that woofer is, is putting out. So, what, so what's happening then is that an acoustic reflex uh, woofer needs to um, it have far, more and more excursion the lower you go. And it's just, it's just linear. It's, just, it's actually logarithmic. It needs to reach enormous excursions uh, to get really low bass. Um, and another trait of an acoustic suspension speaker is that the roll-off starts at a much higher frequency, generally speaking, but it rolls off uh, at half of the rate. It rolls off at a 12 dB per octave rate, whereas a bass reflex speaker will start rolling off at a lower uh, frequency, but it will roll off twice as fast, generally, at a 24 dB per octave rate as it goes out. Um, the benefit of the bass reflex is that at that tuning frequency where the port and the woofer are out of phase, um, that energy, that acoustic energy inside the, the chamber is holding that, holding the woofer still essentially. And the majority of the, the bass energy is actually coming out of the port. And so the advantage of that is that the excursion of the woofer um, is far, far lower 
the requirements are far, far lower in excursion than they are with an acoustic suspension. I'm back. And, you know, I, I, I am fascinated by this because, well, box speakers are by far the most popular type of speaker. And that's what most people hear, including most audiophiles. And that's the sort of the purpose of this discussion. But they all, uh, let's say, play the room very differently. Box speakers versus panel speakers versus omnidirectional speakers versus horn speakers. Uh, they're, all, they're all putting sound into the room in very, very different ways. Now, I'm not going to say which one is the most accurate, but I would say that I think boxes are, well, I have my problems with boxes because they seem to be the least, for lack of a better word, natural. Uh, because they're just pushing sound forward. Uh, so instruments uh, radiate sound 360, more or less. Uh, voices do project sound forward, but there's a, a wholeness to the sound of human voice that I'm not sure it, the box speakers get that right or as naturally. Let's put it that way. Now, I'm not dissing speaker, box speakers entirely here. I'm just trying to put some perspective here, right? So panel speakers, whether they're open baffle speakers, magna pan, planar magnetic speakers, or electrostatic speakers, they radiate sound forward and back more or less equally, right? So they're energizing the room entire, in a very, very, very different way than a box speaker does. Actually, more like the sound being picked up by microphones, right? So there is that to consider. Uh, now, horn speakers, which kind of look like box speakers, but they project sound forward, and that was discussed in the video. But the thing to consider here is they, they I, I could also classify them as unnatural, but the, but the interesting thing about horn speakers is, is that pretty much every live concert you've ever been to in your entire life, the sound coming out of those speakers was, the speakers were horn speakers. PA speakers, concert PA speakers are horns. So in that sense, the horn is, in quotes, a natural way to hear music because it's the way we do hear music in real life that isn't acoustic or right in front of you, right? So again, this is just basically a think piece. I want you to consider the possibilities. And, and, and what I'm really saying here is, Oh, and omnidirectional, oh, I almost forgot omnis. So omnis are just pushing sound more or less 360, right? Much closer to the sound of instruments. So uh, when I reviewed the Ohm Walsh 2000 not so long ago, and I'll link to it below, it's just so much more like real things. It doesn't have the pinpoint focus of a box speaker, of a well-designed box speaker, or, or many of these other types of speakers, but it has it has space, it has wholeness, it has something correct about the sound of an omnidirectional. So all I'm saying here is if you've only lived with box speakers for your entire audiophile life, consider the possibilities. That's it. That's all, all I'm suggesting here. And for the viewers out there who have experimented with other speaker types other than boxes, I want to hear from you. If you've experimented with omnis and panels and horns and everything and said, you know what, in the end I want to go back to boxes, that's good too. I want to hear from you guys. My name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show and it does come up daily, more or less six or seven days a week. And uh, if you dig it, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Share these videos with your friends. Uh, like them. Give them a thumbs up do all that social media stuff. You can follow me on Twitter at Audiophiliac Man. You can follow me on Instagram at steve.guttenberg.com. And boy, oh boy, if you've gotten this far into this very long video, check out my Patreon at p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash, say it together class, Audiophiliac. Thank you so much for watching.